Good morning, girl up. Good morning. You know, I think we talked about being energized and speaking up. So I just want to know who in this room is energized with confidence. I learned at a very young age from my mother that beauty is not about what you look like on the outside, but it's what you feel on the inside. So I coined the phrase and hashtag confidence is beautiful. And then I learned from being the only female CEO in the top 25 in my field with no female role models and no peers that there's power in the pack. That there's something really incredible about being surrounded by like-minded people, by like-minded women that give you that confidence. And so I created a girls' lounge that was a place for corporate women to connect authentically, to inspire and learn from one another. And one of the things that I learned was if we could have done it alone, we would have by now. And then came Gloria Steinem, the original, the feminist, and Emma Stone, Emma Watson. Emma Stone is also pretty amazing. <laughs> Emma Watson came up with He for She. And they came up with the idea that feminism has to include men. So we respelled we re the word feminism, F-E-M-E-N. I S M to include the word men. And then what was remarkable was I was watching a Sarah Jessica Parker movie that I loved. And she said, a waste of a woman is when she tries to be a man. And that was really incredible to me, where I decided it was time for me to encourage women to bring their voices to the table and to stand out with who they were and lead with generosity and break a lot of rules that made no sense for them as they were rising the ranks. And what's the most remarkable is what I've learned from each and every one of you, our young leaders. We used to say it's the next generation. You are not the next generation. You are the now generation. You are today. You are our leaders today. You taught me that leadership is not about age, it's about action. And I'm watching and learning so much from each and every one of you every single day. Here's to all of you at Girl Up. I am so proud to be one of your mentees and learn how you're doing what you're doing so beautifully. But ultimately, Real learning comes when women help each other. Look around at who's sitting next to you, the inspiration surrounding you. The way we learn from one another is sharing real stories with real questions, with real answers, and most importantly, getting real. How do you do that? You ask her. That's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna ask her, and her, and her and her, and her, and her. How do we do it all? Here's to each and every one of you. So. Okay, sorry. Okay, so let's forget all the formal stuff and just get right into it and let's be candid. What were the best and worst decisions you've made throughout your career? Well, sure, I'll start. Um, so the worst decision I ever made was when I was young and starting out, and I was um, just started as a salesperson in my field. I'm in advertising sales, um, currently at NBCU, and I was at a different company at the time, and I was working for a man who um, really mistreated me in, in many ways. One who told me that I didn't need to make as much money as the other men on my team because I didn't have a family and I was young and just starting out 
And I was so hungry that I was killing it on my budget, and he just kept adding more and more budget to me. He gave me old maid cards for Christmas and said that if I kept working as hard as I did, I was going to be an old maid. And instead of um, speaking up, I ended up quitting a job that I absolutely loved and left the company. And I was just, you know, it was a different time, and I was just afraid that my one voice would be not heard. And so the best decision I ever made was when I worked for um, another person who was really abusive. And I was the, the sales manager at the time. I spoke up. And I spoke up for my team and for myself. And I said, this abuse has to end. And I changed the situation. And today, you're here to, to learn about speaking up. And what I can tell you is not speaking up was one of my biggest regrets, because I thought, ultimately, that man got fired for doing what he did to me to other people. And if I would have spoken up the first time, I could have maybe stopped other people from getting hurt. But I was young and afraid. and. I didn't have the confidence that Shelley talked about. So when I got a little bit older and I realized I look back at my failure as what I saw as a failure, and I spoke up and made a difference for others. So uh, I was thinking hard about this question. And um, I think I probably, the worst decision I um, ever made is a decision um, not to actually speak up about how much I was actually worth in a company. And I've done that three times. So it wasn't something I learned from the first time, the second time, and the third time. In fact, the only time I really realized what I was worth is when I quit to go somewhere else. They often off offered to double my salary, put my name on the door, all kinds of things that I just hadn't really asked for myself. So I, I guess in some ways I hold myself accountable for not standing up and asking for what I actually deserved. Um, and so I'd encourage all of you. When you, whatever job you're in, to think about what you're actually worth and to make sure that you're asking for it. Because I think men are much better at asking for what they think they're worth than women. Um, and the best decision I ever made was to go and start my own company. Um, and I've run some fabulous companies with great people, and I loved it, but there's nothing better than having your own company, um, making your own decisions, bringing people in, watching them grow, learning from them. Um, you know, making sure that you're not going to let them make the mistakes that you made. Um, there's nothing more exhilarating or terrifying. Um, and it's good to be terrified, I think, every now and again. God, I have so many um, bad decisions that turned into great decisions because they were such bad decisions at the beginning. Um, I, as my bio said, I am the chief troublemaker. I've been in trouble my whole career, um, mainly because I break all the rules. Not because I want to be a rule breaker, but they just didn't make sense to me. And even at the age of 25, I remember having a male boss who reported to another man, who reported to another man, who reported to another man. And, and I always thought with my heart, you know, when you feel a situation, you know what's right or wrong. And we were sitting around, and I'm in market research, and I don't know if you remember market research, the traditional market research where you get a phone call from an old lady on the phone that says, do you have a few minutes to answer some questions, which turns into 45 minutes of questions. And you, know, you get stopped in a shopping mall. And I had this idea to migrate research from telephone to the internet. And I was sitting around a room with a bunch of guys. And I said, well, why don't we migrate research online? And every single person in the room said, it's not the right time. Now, it wasn't. It was a day and age where the internet was just where wealthy old men with broadband were connecting. So it was not at all a representative population. But what about the possibilities? What if we could do research online? And I was told that it was just not the right time. And I remember going home and saying to my husband, I don't understand. When is the right time? When is it going to be the right time? Is God going to tell us when the right time is? And I went into work the next day, and I said, I have to pioneer online research. I'm going to make it the right time. And so I think for me, I had to find my own voice in a day and age where no one was giving me permission to be right. I had to listen to myself, believe in myself, have confidence in myself. And I went off and pioneered online research, which is the new norm today. And I made it the right time. So the best decision for me was following what I say my heartbeat. It wasn't even an aha moment. When your heart is beating so hard, you have to do something about it. 
When your head tells you something, you can rationalize it and say, no, I'm going to make that voice go away. But when your heart is palpitating so hard, you can't control a heartbeat. You have to follow that and follow your passion, and it will take you and lead you to your next place. Great. I'd really like to know, what do you guys love about your position? I think I, I, think I uh, maybe answered that with what, you know, kind of, the, kind of the best thing I've ever done. is I love running my own company. I love um, being able to hire whoever I want to hire. I love watching them thrive and grow. I love knowing where I'm going, but kind of being able to work out how I'm going to get there without maybe somebody else telling me what to do. Um, yeah, there's nothing better than being able to fill your passions. And I think to build on something that Shelley had said, she's talked about being real. Being your authentic self, knowing that you can be who you want to be every day, Talk about exactly what needs to get talked about because not everybody's always comfortable doing that. There is nothing, there's nothing more fulfilling than kind of being your, your real self and then letting other people around you be their real selves too. I love being part of a team and working together to achieve incredible results and overcome adversity, obstacles and challenges by working together, working with people who are different and who have different skill sets and finding a way to be like a puzzle where you click and you make your uniqueness more powerful by connecting with other people's uniqueness to me is just such an incredible thing. I am so fortunate at NBCU to be part of an incredible company and teams of people who are just so smart and so hardworking and collaborative and to me that is, is really fun and to work in an industry where our clients are like that. I mean, that's how I, I met Shelley and Rosemary. And um, just to be a part of, of that and be a part of a team, to me, is something that I absolutely love. I say when uh, purpose meets passion, you are unstoppable. And I have followed my passion my whole career, having fun along the way. You know, there's bumps in the roads. You're going to go like this, and you're going to go like this. But it's what Laura said, when you have a group of girlfriends, like I, I love, I love what I do. You know, one of the things I say all the time to all my employees is when you don't like what you do, it's called stress. When you love what you do, it's called passion. I love what I do. Why? Because I make the rules for what I want to do. I write my journey, and not because I'm the CEO. All my employees write their own journey. Be the best that you could be. Own it. Own who you are. Bring who you are to the table. There was a great quote that I loved that was, um, you have to be yourself because everyone, el because everyone else is taken. <laughs> but just be your best self. I mean, that is so darn good. And I think one of the things, you know, even though I'm a more experienced leader, 53, I still have fun. And this is a sorority. Like, you know, you can actually have a group of amazing people that you can be in business with and have a wonderful time. And we could be competitors. We could be in the same industry. We could be in different industries. But if we make each other better, I've got great skill sets. You have different skill sets. You have creative beyond, you know, amazing skill sets. If we can partner together on it, life is fun. Work does not have to be boring. We can have a good time and sex it up all the time. You know, what's wrong with that picture? So, you and know, she I, does. I think that's what I love. <laughs> yeah. And wear pink shoes, girl yeah. up. <laughs> Always good shoes. So my next question, I'm sure we'd all like to know, at what age did you truly know or know what you were planning to do with your life? I know. I, I um, was fortunate enough to go to Syracuse University to Newhouse School and study advertising. I knew, my, my mom said I had a scrapbook from when I was in second grade that had advertisements and the TV guide cut out and pasted near each other. And so when I saw someone speak, because many companies came to our school to, to talk about what they did and to recruit, um, I saw someone actually, back then, they were from NBC, and they spoke about what they did. And I was 
really inspired and motivated by so many things because I think television is an incredible um, form of communication and you know our lives are just enriched by media and the creativity of programming and you know that's how people learn about so many things and the way to support that is through advertising so I just I felt like it was a natural fit for me and I felt very lucky that at 21 years old I had a mentor in my college which I highly recommend you find a mentor wherever you are and she helped get me she said you need to start at an ad agency and learn about that side of the business first and I was very lucky and fortunate that at 21 years old I knew what I wanted to do and many years later I'm still doing it. I wasn't that fortunate. So I studied literature and philosophy, which doesn't really set you up for anything. <laughs> but um, but I, I kind of did, I loved advertising too. I loved communications, I loved PR. I felt that that's kind of, I mean, I love people, ultimately in ideas. So I knew that was an area that I was interested in. And it wasn't really till I was 24, one of my good friends was working at an advertising agency and said to me, you know, there's this new discipline called account planning, brand planning, which is really about understanding people and their relationship with each other and brands, and I think you'd be really good at that. So I, you know, went out to find out more about it, and it turned out to be incredibly competitive and very hard to get into. So I wrote a letter um, to the top 10 advertising agencies at the time, which I'd done some research on, and, you know, and I thought, I've got to get these people's attention, because I actually don't have, you know, probably the rel relevant... Um, um, degree to get into this particular like role, and I, you know, and I said, look, so there's a really famous football player whose name was Chris Waddle, and soccer that is in England, really famous soccer player, you, you know, who started life out in a sausage factory, and he's now like the number one player for England, and I think I can do the same thing in brand planning if you just give me a chance, and I wrote that letter, and every single one of those people invited me in for an interview, because they just found the letter to be fun and a kind of different take on it, and I got offered a job. And I've, I mean, it was, um, I, I've never felt happier. I knew as soon as I started that job that that's kind of what I wanted to do. And when passion and purpose meet, you do amazing things. I had no idea. I mean, zero idea what I wanted to do. Um, I fell into my career. Um, and, you know, I actually was going to be a full-time mom because my mother was a stay-at-home mom and was always there, you know, when I came home from school. So I thought when I had a family, that's what I was going to do. And when I was undergrad, I, uh, I actually got a D in statistics. I run one of the largest research companies in the world, just saying, a D in statistics. Um, and I didn't get it. It was math, and I didn't know how to, I, I see in pictures, I didn't know how to make a picture out of numbers. It just didn't make sense to me until one day I woke up and I actually got it. And I said, wow, if I could start a research company and make data simple and turn it into stories and contextualize it in very relevant ways, how great would that be? But I really fell into my career. Um, it actually started when I interviewed in a small little research company. I thought it was an ad agency, and it sounded really kind of hot. You know, I saw it on the job board, and it looked like it was a creative agency, and I thought I'd meet great guys there, you know, young, hot guys. And <laughs> I, it turned out I showed up, and it was five women <laughs> all eating, you know, frozen yogurt and gossiping, you know, over what was in People magazine. And I'm like, I can do this job. This is easy. And I ended up working there, and it was market research. So I ended up in data, doing statistics, um, and you know, contextualizing data into into stories. And and then my career just sort of took an amazing turn from there. I have no MBA. I have an undergraduate degree, and I ended up building you know my own research company with 250 employees, um, doing quite well and building something that didn't exist before. Not because I learned it in a textbook. It was because I was curious and I was willing to fail, and I was willing to try new things, and I was willing to learn from other people, and I was willing to ask questions. And that's how I ended up running a market research company with no business degree. And I created an uncorporate company. I broke all the rules from corporations that I hated as I was in corporations, got rid of all of them, and created my own set of rules. And I actually created a company that was a lifestyle company before lifestyle was anything we ever talked about. But I said to myself, how would I build a company that I would want to work for? 
and that all my employees one day would want to work for. So it was a lifestyle company that allowed me to be a mother, a wife, a mother of three, a wife, do social good, and also build a research company. Okay, since today's theme is speak up, do you have any advice for girls who are afraid or too shy to speak up? Go ahead, why don't you start, Shelley? You know, I remember, this is just a real example, when I was asked to do my first, when I started working in a big corporation in research, and, and someone told me that I had to do the client presentation. And in those day and age, you won't remember this, but we had acetates. It was this big overhead projector. Oh, God. <laughs> this big. <laughs> we also had mainframe Your hand computers. was shaking as you were putting the... Yeah, they were like these little acetates with white paper in between. You had to flip the pages. That's how you did... Pow it, instead of PowerPoint, that's how we did it. And they threw me in front of the client. It was for, actually, um, legs, pantyhose. And I had to get up in front of 100 people and do a data presentation. And I was, I, I was really scared and very nervous. It was my first presentation ever. And I was not planning to do it. And my boss said, you're going to do it. I'm throwing you in. You're going to get good at this. And I was turning the page. And I was horrible. I was so bad. It was the worst presentation I ever made. I read the copy. It was terrible. But I did it. And what this guy said to me was, you know what, Shelley? You wrote the deck. You know it better than anyone else. It's coming from you. What are you so nervous about? The, the client doesn't even know what you're going to say, but you wrote it. Find your voice. And I got through the first one, and it was bad, but I did it. Check. Then in the afternoon, we had to do another presentation with the client, and it wasn't supposed to be me, even though I wrote it. And he said, you're now going to do the next one, too. And you know what? I was really good. Like, the first one sucked. The second one was much better because I got in a rhythm. So what is my advice to you is own your voice. What you bring to the table is unique. If you don't share what's on your mind, it might not be shared. One of my mottos in life is if you don't ask, you'll never know. If you don't try something, You'll never move to the next level. If you fail, that's great. It means you're doing something that's never been done before. Just don't make stupid mistakes and don't make the same mistake twice. That's dumb. That's a bad idea. And more importantly, there's always a solution. Find it. And the one word you should always know is yes. Even if you don't know how to get there, find your girlfriends, they'll help you out say yes to yourself, and then figure out how to make it happen. And confidence is beautiful. And once you do it, you'll realize it's not that hard, and it will become second nature to you. That's, <laughs> it's hard to follow that. Um, speaking up is not always about you know having a big, loud voice. Sometimes it's, it's taking a little step at a time. And I often tell that to when we have new hires and we'll have new hire orientation and I will be asked to speak and give advice. And what I say is that um, if you want to rise in your company, let your voice be heard. And the best way to do that is that often the leaders and the people who are managing work late and they, they're working on projects. And it is okay to stop by their office and say, is there anything I can do to help? You have unique skills that the leaders don't have just by being from your generation. And whether it's your Snapchat savvy or your just ability to um, speak to millennials, is, is a unique gift that many leaders can benefit from. And you know, a small example of this, when I was starting out in business, the head of my department was always working late, and you know, I had learned from my father, like, you don't leave till the boss leaves, so I was there. And I, often being young and starting out, didn't have something to do, so I went into her office and I said, is there anything I can help you with? And the first time she said no, the second time she gave me a spreadsheet full of numbers and she said, can you go back to your office and add these up? 
Well, this was in the 80s, and computers weren't the norm, but I had learned how to use a computer in college because it was much easier to do my papers and projects on. And so I went into the computer room, and I put all the numbers into a spreadsheet, which is now Excel, and I double-checked the numbers were right, and I hit the sum formula, and I added up the numbers, and you know, maybe 15 minutes later, I walked into her office, and I'm like, here you go, and it was on a spreadsheet all typed up, and she was like, how did you do that so fast? And, you know, I said, oh, I, I used a computer. And she was like, you know how to use a computer? And the next thing you know, the next day she called me into her office during the day and said, I have a project for you. And then more projects. And then within a year I got promoted. And so I tell that story. And I think the smartest, most passionate, aggressive young people are the ones that come in my office and say, do you have something? Because I usually do. <laughs> and, um, and so many of them in, in, you know, that, that are, I look back in my career, and I, there are so many of them who are now at top levels in their career, and they started out by coming in my office and saying, is there something I can do? So speak up and make yourself known in wherever you are. We yeah, are so I, old. I just want to say we're so old. I used a typewriter, though. We didn't even have computers. It was a typewriter. Like I, I used a typewriter, too. Okay, fine. Just making sure. That I'm not that much, I used not a that computer. much older than you. But the first Apple computer, I remember it really well. Um, so that's, again, I mean, that's hard to follow. I guess two things, I think, to build on what you've said, I think... There are lots of things, there are a lot of things that need to get done inside organizations. And, you know, some people tend to kind of gravitate to the kind of the sexy, more interesting things. If something needs to get done and you kind of put your hand up, and maybe it's not the most glamorous project, but you put your hand up and you kind of put your heart and soul into that, that will actually help you kind of get to the next level. So don't just wait for that choice, perfect assignment. Every assignment can be fantastic. I think the, the second thing is I believe women are particularly good at kind of naming the truth, seeing what's really going on and helping everybody else see what that is. So think about what's actually happening in the room. Take a step back out of the, outside of the conversation and say, okay, what is really the issue that we're facing here? Because sometimes when you put the truth out on the table, it's much easier to kind of move that conversation forward. And, you know, you guys do have a real unique perspective that we probably don't have um, and that we, we actually need that perspective in order to kind of build our businesses. So what you have to say is actually important if we're all gonna succeed. Thank you ladies so much for your time and for joining us today. Will everybody please join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you so much. I think one of the things Thanks, that would be great um, just very quickly is the whole concept of Ask Her is it's real questions from, you know, you guys, that if you have anything that you want to ask women that have been there, done that, and are continuing, continuously doing it, I'd like to just open it up very quickly for a quick question, if anybody out there has okay. one. Do we have mics? No. I don't need a mic. It's okay. Okay. Um, I wanted to know, what do you see in girls who are worried about balancing a family and a career? See, I don't think it's about balance. The question was, what do you say to girls who are worried about balancing a family and career? So, um, I have one kid. Shelley has three kids. I don't know. I have two. You have two kids. Um, I would say it's not about balance. It's about boundaries. So, you know, understand what's okay for you and what isn't okay for you and your family. And as long as everybody's kind of clear about what that is, I, th I think you'll be fine. Um, it's like Hillary Clinton said... It takes a village, and you have to build your community of support so that you can succeed and create your boundaries and then live your life. And I will tell you this, I spent a lot of years feeling guilty about working too much, about, you know, not being in the office at, you know, the right hour in the morning so I could get my girls off the bus to school. And once I stopped the guilt, I was much more powerful. So it's like... Don't have the guilt, be who you are, and, and you can do it all and have a really wonderful, powerful career and fabulous family. And I am so fortunate that my husband really supports me, my boss really supports me, and my team really supports me. And I think you need all those things. And I've also had the same nanny for 15 years. Yeah, 
Oh, Thank we you. have to get off stage. Balance is a bad word, by the way. Balance doesn't exist. Nothing is 50-50. You have one life with many dimensions. Figure out how to do it. And Gloria Steinem said it perfectly. She said, men aren't asking about work-life balance. It's called one life. Live it. Enjoy it. And every day, think forward. Thank you.